Hello, biologists. Welcome to week 10. For our last lecture, we're going to talk about fungi as an example of a lot of different concepts that we've learned this term. So we're going to synthesize our information and we're going to talk about our fungal friends in the process. Let's go ahead and get started. Fungi have seven characteristics that make them fungus. So the first thing they need to be is eukaryotic. You remember that vocab word from 211. Eukaryotes have organ bound, um, membrane bound organelles in their cells. So fungi have nuclei, they have mitochondria, um, they have endoplasmic reticulum, they have all that good stuff. So they are eukaryotic. Almost all of our fungi are multicellular, except for yeasts. Yeasts are weird, but most of them are multicellular and their bodies are made of filaments. So we describe them as filamentous. Our fungi are all heterotrophic. Hetero being different, trophic means eating, which means they have to get their food from a source other than themselves. So they're gonna eat something and it's either gonna be living or dead. We'll talk about that. And when they eat something, the way they do it is with extracellular digestion. Basically they use the same digestive enzymes as we do, but instead of putting food into a stomach and digesting it, they take their digestive juices and they release it into the world outside of their body and they let it digest their food outside of their filaments and then they suck up the nutrients. So it's outside extra cellular digestion. Fungi have cell walls and instead of being made of uh, cellulose like plants, their cell walls are made of chitin Chitin is also found in the exoskeletons of insects. So it's another place that you find it is fungus and bugs. When your fungus is gonna do mitosis or meiosis because it has to grow and it's gonna reproduce, it's going to perform intranuclear mitosis and meiosis. And what that means is that the nuclear membrane does not break down in prophase. Everything else is the same. So prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, just like your cells, except the first step in prophase is that the nuclear envelope disintegrates. That's not true for fungi. They keep that nuclear envelope intact and everything that happens, happens inside the nuclear envelope. And then the nucleus splits into two different nuclei. When your fungus has extra carbohydrates, it stores them as glycogen and lipids, which is the same thing you do because fungi are more closely related to you than they are to plants. Plants, when they have extra carbohydrates, they store the excess as starch. So they, fungi, do not, they make fats and they make glycogen just like you do. And the last concept we're going to talk about for our fungus is that they're going to use the codon UGA for tryptophan. Unlike us, think back to 212, what does UGA code for? It's a stop codon. You go away, UGA, one of our three stop codons. Not true for fungus, instead it's just for tryptophan. So those are some characteristics. There are other things too, like fungi are going to reproduce with spores, but so do ferns. So if we have all these seven characteristics, then what we're looking at is a fungus. When we look at a fungus, we're used to thinking about a mushroom, and that is a fungus. Here's some beautiful porcini mushrooms. It's got that stalk and the cap that you're used to seeing. But that's just one part of your fungus. Here we're looking at a mushroom as well in cross section. So that's actually its reproductive structure. The whole body of the fungus is below the mushroom in the ground and it's made of these filaments. That's why we call them filamentous. If we're look at the filaments up close, like here in the microscope, one single branch is called a hyphae and more than one branch together is called mycelium. 
So the body is all mycelium and it lives for thousands of years sometimes. And you only ever see it when it wants to reproduce. And when it wants to reproduce, it'll make a mushroom above ground. And that's what we think of as the fungus. So its whole structure is below ground and its reproductive structure is above ground. I think about it like if you had an apple tree, except the whole tree lived underground and it only pushed its apples above ground. That's what a fungus is doing. So we only see the reproductive structure, not the whole individual, which is cool because if I were to see these mushrooms in the wild, those are good edibles. I would pick them. And when I pick them, I'm not actually hurting the fungus because the fungus is still underground living. All I'm doing is picking that apple off the apple tree. And so I can remove those fruiting bodies and the fungus will be okay. This is what a fungal life cycle looks like. Um, there's a lot going on here. Let me give you an overview. We're going to start with the mushroom. So here's a mushroom. There's some extra vocab words on this that you don't need to worry about. On this mushroom, there are some gills. Those gills produce spores. So these are the gills. And up close, these are the spore producing regions of the gills. They're called basidia. I do want you to know the word basidia. These basidia are going to produce spores. Those spores are made of um, two nuclei that fuse together. That's karyogamy. Remember the word karyotype? Kary refers to nucleus. Ogamy means fusing together. So those two nuclei fuse together. And then as soon as they fuse together, it undergoes meiosis. So it does meiosis and it produces four spores that are genetically not identical. Just like we would produce four sperm or four egg through meiosis, your fungus produces four spores. So here are the structures, the basidia, that are producing the spores. This is what it really looks like. This is through an electron microscope. Here's your basidia, here are your four spores. Each one of those was produced by meiosis. And since you made it in meiosis, you know that these spores are haploid because we produce four genetically non-identical haploid cells in meiosis. The wind will come, it'll blow those spores away. They'll go and they'll find a nice place to land. They'll germinate, which means they're gonna grow. They'll start to make one single strand so a hyphae, which will then branch into multiple strands. We call that mycelium. And your mycelium will grow and grow and grow until it finds a mate. So here we have two different mycelia. These are two different individuals of the same type of fungus. And your fungi don't have sex the way that we do. Like they don't have male and female. Instead, they have to be genetically compatible. And so we often show that as different colors, like here one's red and one's blue, or we show that with pluses and with minuses. So one's a plus and one's a minus, but it can get really complicated. There can be thousands of different mating types for one fungus. So if you thought um, gender and sex was weird in humans and we only have a couple options, fungi have thousands of options. And so it makes it much more exciting. So here I have a mycelium that's growing. And if it finds a mate, it will grow next to its mate. If they are compatible, they will fuse their hyphae together. And it will take one nuclei from each parent. And in each cell of this new growing mycelium, you'll have two nuclei. The fusion of the hyphae is called plasmogamy. We're joining something together. What are we joining together? The cytoplasm. And now that I have two nuclei in each of my cells, I refer to this mycelium as dikaryotic, so two karyotypes. This is the structure that will grow and produce a mushroom. So if I were to cut open this mushroom and look at it in the microscope, the whole thing is made of dikaryotic hyphae. It'll produce the basidia on the gills, and those basidia have one nuclei from each. And then we're back at the beginning. You're going to take those two nuclei, you're going to fuse them together. So this pink strip, 
This is the only diploid stage of the life cycle. Once you have a diploid nucleus in your basidia, you do meiosis that produces spores and the whole thing starts over. Now fungi have a couple different ways that they exist in the world. And we refer to that as fungal ecology, which is what we've been focusing on this term. They can either get their food from something living, which is called biotrophic. Remember trophic is eating and bio is living. So they're gonna get their food by having a partnership with someone living or by parasitizing someone living. Or a fungus can get its food by being saprotrophic, which means that it's decomposing dead material. So it's getting its, its food from something that's dead already. We refer to saprotrophic fungi as decomposers and they're really important to our ecosystem. If you think about all the leaves that fall in um, fall, and if you think about the branches that fall off in the trees or like poop or dead animals, all of those dead things, someone has to break them down and get those nutrients available to be used again. And that someone is fungus. That's what they do for us is they take garbage basically and recycle it into good things. Speaking of garbage, bioremediation is gonna be huge in the future. It's the idea that we can take something living, specifically fungus in this case, and we can use it to remediate a bad habitat. Um, they've done experiments where they've taken toxic waste and they've inoculated it with fungus and the fungus has detoxified the waste. So fungi are probably gonna be what save our planet. <laughs> I personally am really looking forward to all the science that's going into it right now. Now, if you're a fungus and you're not a decomposer, your relationship with whoever you're getting your food from can either benefit both of you, which is a mutualism, benefit one of you, but not harm the other, that's a commensalism, or be a parasitism, which is one person benefits and the other person's harmed. In this case, the fungus benefits and it's harming somebody else. We often think about parasitism when we think about fungi. We think about like yeast infections and athlete's foot and um, blights on crops or rust that are killing your rows or whatever it is. And that happens. In fact, about 30% of all biotrophic fungi are pathogen or parasite like that fungus that's killing the bats that we talked about earlier, the white nose syndrome. So all of this white on this bat's face is literally hyphae growing out of the bat's body. So it's eating it from the inside out. So 30% are hurting somebody else. And if you're interested in gross medical stuff, here's a website for you to check out from the CDC all about fungal diseases. I'm not going to show you any because I don't like gross stuff. I'd much rather talk about the other options, which are commensalism and mutualism. So let's start with commensalism. This is the picture of a very tiny plant that is growing. So all of these things are plant cells. This is what we call the apical meristem. This is going to become the shoot of the plant. And in between these cells, all this black material, that's actually fungus. There's fungus growing in this baby plant and we call them endophytes. Endo being inside, phyte being plants. And it's so exciting because we don't know what the fungus is doing yet. It doesn't seem to be hurting the plants. And this is the most exciting part, it's in every single plant we've looked at. So we might need to change our definition of what a plant is because it seems like all plants contain fungus. There's a lot we need to learn about this, but it's a good example of a commensalism. The fungi is existing. It's getting nutrients from the plant because it can't do photosynthesis. Fungi cannot make their own sugars. So it's getting the sugars from the plant and the plant in return doesn't seem harmed at all, but it doesn't seem to be benefiting. My favorite example of fungi are all mutualisms because I love it when things work together. 
here's one of our best examples of a mutualism. You've probably heard of leaf cutter ants. There's different types of ants. These are all the same species. They live in the same colony. This one's the worker, it's big and strong. These are organizing and like the bosses, they help to tell this one what to do. And these ants can strip a whole tree in the course of a single night. And they collect all of this leaf material. And we used to think the ants were eating the leaves, but we know now that they're not. The ants are actually farmers. And what they're doing is they're collecting food that they bring back to their comb. And this whole comb is made out of fungus. And they feed the leaf to the fungus. And in return, the fungus produces these little nodules that are really delicious and full of nutrients. So the ant eats the fungus, but it keeps it alive and happy. So it's farming the fungus by bringing it plants. It's an amazing system. And ants aren't the only ones that do it. Termites do it too. So this is what we call a termite tower. And you can see down at the bottom, there's these mushrooms coming out. That's because if you clear away this termite tower, under it, there is a comb of fungus. And the termites collect woody material. They actually eat it and then they poop it out. It's called pseudo feces, but they poop it out just for the fungus. And then the fungus eats the wood and they eat the fungus. So 80% of termites don't actually eat wood, they eat fungus and they collect the wood for the fungus. So they're also farming. You can see the little mushrooms here. What's really cool about these termite mounds is they keep the fungus underground because they don't want it to get too hot. And up here, this whole mound, it's empty but full of tunnels. And its whole purpose is to suck in oxygen and to ex exhale carbon dioxide. So this above ground structure is ventilation. The termites themselves live down here next to the fungus. So no one lives in this above ground structure, but because your fungus is working so hard eating all that woody material, it needs as much oxygen as a cow. And so they built this structure to bring in oxygen and get rid of its carbon dioxide. They ventilated it. Our other wonderful example of a mutualism with fungus is called mycorrhizae. Go ahead and say that to yourself, mycorrhizae. And this is how it works. I've got a little pine seedling here and you can see these pine seedling roots. It's trying to absorb water. It's doing okay. It's not that great at it, but if you, make a fungi that it can associate with available to it. The fungi will colonize the roots and all of this material out here is fungi material. And so the fungus absorbs all this water and it gives it to the plant. And in return, the plant gives the fungus sugars. And it's more than that, the fungus actually um, can pick up potassium and phosphorus and nitrogen that the plant's not good at getting itself. And the fungus makes antibiotics that the plant needs. And so it makes all this stuff and it gives it to its partner, the plant. And the plant makes sugars and it shunts the sugars down to the fungus. And so they both benefit from this association. We currently think that 92% of plants on earth are mycorrhizal. Most of our crops, our food sources are mycorrhizal. So if we know that plants are important, we now have to know that fungi are equally as important because if we take away the mycorrhizal fungi, many of those plants, the 92% of them just die. There are actually some plants, specifically orchids, that will not germinate. Their seeds won't grow unless they're in the presence of their mycorrhizal partner. It's very specific. Let's talk a little bit about how fungi evolved. So here I've got this great phylogenetic tree. It's a big tree. Um, down here we have the original eukaryotes. 
Then we have this branching event that gave us all the different types of creatures on Earth. So amoebas, euglena, um, all sorts of stuff. Over here we have fungi, over here we have animals, plants are here. So this is essentially a tree of life. And about 1.2 billion years ago, there was a branching event between animals and fungus. Back down here, there was a branching event that leads to plants. So the node that connects animals and fungus is much more recent than the node that connects plants and fungus. So we're more closely related to mushrooms than they are to the trees that they associate so well with. Then about uh, 700 million years ago, there's a symbiosis with algae, which allows fungi and algae to start to colonize land instead of just being in the water. And about 470 million years ago, plants move from water onto land. And we don't think that they would have been able to do it without their fungal partners because the fungi are so good at collecting water, just like we saw in that mycorrhizae, that they will absorb um, the liquid that they need because moving onto land is really drying you out, right? It's hard to go from the ocean to land. And so we think that plants wouldn't have made the transition without their fungal partners. We have five main phyla of fungi and I wanna show you an example of each. So this is gonna be like a tour of the kingdom. The first one are chytrids. Then you have zygomycota are buscular mycota, ascomycota, and basidiomycota. These are what we traditionally think of as fungus. So if you've ever seen a mushroom on a walk or gone mushroom hunting, you are looking at ascomycota and basidiomycota. The other three are pretty unknown. Like we don't even know how to connect this to the tree. That's what the dot, dot, dot means. And they're, they're really small and microscopic and hard to find. So these are understudied groups. These are the more studied groups. Let's look at chytrids first. So phylum chytridium mycota, they're mostly freshwater. They look like this. This is the spore. These are the hyphae growing. They're really small. And most of the time, they just kind of sit there in the water and decompose plants and decompose algae. But there is one type of chytridiomycota that is attacking amphibians. And chytridiomycosis is one of the leading causes of amphibian death. We're concerned we're going to lose amphibians in the next couple of generations. And part of it is because of this parasite. So that's chytridiomycota. Then you have phylum zygomycota. This is the bread mold. So anytime you've seen a bread mold or um, something like that, it's usually zygomycota. It grows hyphae through the bread. And then that fuzzy part that you see, that's the reproductive structure. That's where it's producing spores. But zygomycota also is really important to us. We make a lot of pharmaceuticals with it, including birth control. So birth control is made of a fungus, um, anesthetics, different types of buffers, and food coloring. So the yellow in margarine comes from this fungus, this phylum. Phylum glomeromycota, you almost never see it because it's all microscopic. And if you look at it in the microscope, it looks like this beautiful little tree. Here's the weird part. This is inside a plant again. So glomeromycota associate with plants at their roots and they push inside the plant cell and then they make this tree-like structure. So on the outside is plant material, on the inside is fungal material and their plasma membranes contact each other and they just exchange nutrients. So the benefit of this for the plant is, again, water absorption, antibiotics, all those different nutrients that the fungus can pick up. And in return, the plant gives glomeromycota sugars. So this is one of our mycorrhizal partners. Our fourth group out of five is ascomycota. 
this is the group that has all sorts of good stuff to eat. So if you like blue cheese, the blue in the blue cheese is all fungus. Uh, if you look at it in a microscope, it's actually as much fungus as it is cheese. I love blue cheese. This is also the group that gives us morels. Morels are a spring mushroom. They are wonderfully edible. People love collecting them and eating them. It also is the group that gives us truffles, the most expensive foodstuff on earth. People will pay a ton of money for truffles. And Ascomycota is often called the cup fungi. So you may have seen things like this out on your hikes. They just look like little cups. So that's why they're called the cup fungi is they, they commonly look like little cups. What makes Ascomycota different than the other groups is that when it reproduces and it makes spores, they're made in a little tube, which we call a sac. So they're sac fungi. And this tube is called an ascus. So they're the ascomycota. Mycota is fungus. Ascus is they make an ascus. Because these spores are made in the ascus, we call them ascospores. Then my favorite phylum of the five is Basidiomycota. So Basidiomycota is where you find fungus that looks like a mushroom. So if something looks like a mushroom with the cap and the stalk and the gills, it's a Basidiomycota. We have an extra vocab for the parts of our mushroom. The cap is called the pileus. The gills are called lamellae, which just means plates. Um, so you have lamellae in your bones as well. And the stem is called the stipe. So there's your vocab words. Basidiomycota are called basidiomycota because they reproduce with basidia that make spores. So we call them basidiospores. The basidia is this structure here. Um, you can see them behind me. These are electron microscopes of mushrooms. And so I've been showing you basidia and basidiospores all term behind my head. And then the little spores pop off the end and fly away and try and grow into a new a new fungus. There's actually a bunch of different um, genuses in Basidiomycota. So here's Basidiomycota branching. All of these are Basidiomycota. You're not going to get tested on any of the names, but I want to show you a couple examples. And I like to point out how complex things are when we start looking into them. So here's our first group. It's called the Agaricales. They are agarics. And basically that means that they have a cap and a stalk and they have gills. Let's start on the top right. You've probably seen this kind of mushroom before, the Super Mario mushroom. This is called an Amanita. It's got a white stalk and it can have many different colored caps. This one has a red cap. Down here we have a Mycena. So this is the group that I studied for my thesis. They're really tiny. Their common name is fairy bonnet because someone thought this looked like a little hat a fairy would wear. And some might see the glow in the dark. So this is a real picture. They're bioluminescent. They're producing their own light, which we're not really sure why they do it, but there's a couple different ideas. One is that they're attracting spore dispersers. One is that they're attracting something that will eat a spore disperser. One is that it's just a weird metabolic side effect of what it's doing. Um, but the cute little fairy bonnets are found pretty much everywhere. When I did my grad work, I looked at Mycena in northern Thailand specifically. Before I went, there were 19 Mycenas reported from northern Thailand. I was there a month collecting them. In a month, I found 25 new species that had never been reported from Northern Thailand, and 15 of those were new to science. 15 new species in one month. So we really don't know a lot about fungus. It's estimated we only know 5% of fungus, and that's a good example of how much you can get done in one month. So if you're interested in traveling or going to the tropics or thinking about fungus at all, I highly recommend going into mycology. 
Then we have basidiomycetes that have pores instead of gills. We refer to those as bolletes. You can see the word right here. The porcini is a bolete. We have basidiomycetes that grow on logs. So this would be a saprotrophic decomposer. And then we have basidiomycetes that kind of look like softballs. They're called puff balls because if you break them open, there's puff inside of them. This one looks like a um, lemon meringue pie to me. And all of these are doing similar things in the environment. This one's decomposing. This one is mycorrhizal. It's associated with the trees around it. And this one is just a saprotroph breaking down dead material. One of my favorite groups of Basidiomycota is the stinkhorns. So all three of these is producing this substance right here, it's brown. On this one, it's up on the top. And that substance is called gleba. And what gleba does is it's really, really smelly. It smells like poo. It smells like rotting flesh. And the reason it smells like rotting flesh is because it attracts flies and beetles and things that like to eat carrion. Inside the gleba, you also have your spores. And so as the flies come and they eat the gleba, they get coated in spores and then they fly away and they disperse the spores that way. So these entire structures are made to enhance the chances of getting their spores out in the world, which increases their evolutionary fitness, just to bring it back to another concept. And that's the kingdom fungi, fungi in a nutshell. Um, let me know what you think, email me with questions and we'll We'll talk about some other cool fungus on Thursday. Have a great day.